Hello everybody, Joseph here with Bean to Bar World and on this episode of Chocolate Travels we're going to head on over to Rotterdam, Netherlands and meet the owners of Hiendre and Vere, incredible chocolate makers that are producing some wonderful chocolates. We're going to talk to them, understand what it is they do, why they're doing it, check out their facilities and hopefully you'll learn about Hiendre and Vere and Bean to Bar chocolate in general. Hi everybody, my name is Joseph. Welcome to Bean to Bar World. And today I have Hiendre and Vere, uh, the makers of Hiendre and Vere here. And we're going to talk a little bit about what they do, talk about chocolate, and hopefully we'll learn a lot. So, hello gentlemen. Uh, the first question we have for you is, um, how did your journey in craft chocolate begin? What started you to, to delve into this? and any uh, surprises at the beginning that uh, that you ran into? <laughs> Lots of surprises. Lots of surprises. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Joseph, for uh, inviting us uh, to, to the interview. Uh, we enjoy it. And uh, my name is uh, Jan Willem. And um, my name is Ewald. And we are the founders of Hein and Verde. Yeah. So um, we go back to the corporate strategy department of the National Dutch Telecoms Company. <laughs> That's where we met in the past. Okay. And, uh, and Willem is a really uh, pastry enthusiast and he, buy, he bakes uh, practically every day if, uh, if he gets the chance. Yeah, uh, he's an uh, venologist, so he has a background in, uh, in wine. So, uh, yeah, we, so we like food, we like good food, we like uh, to taste and smell. And actually, that's what we already found out uh, way back, I think in 2006 or seven, mm -hmm. when we first met. And uh, well, in the years after, we started making culinary trips. Uh, also skiing trips in Italy where the food is as important and the wine is as important as the skiing. <laughs> and at one time we were at a, was it Bergamo Airport? Was Ber yeah, yeah. Bergamo Airport. Uh, we bought a, a, a very poor quality uh, chocolate bar and, uh, and we were also intrigued at that time by um, let's say the b 2 bar movements that was starting to, to emerge in the US. So we said, well, in Europe, we got to make, it must be possible to make very good chocolate as well. So why don't we try? Okay. <laughs> and, and basically, uh, that's how it started during a trip. <laughs> so that's, that's interesting that you're in Europe, but it was the Americans that sort of got you thinking about it. How come you didn't, did you not come across companies like uh, Amade or, um, you know, and all that. Well, that's true. So that's true. So in a way, of course, I know, let's say from an American yeah. perspective, uh, let's say from a coronary point, uh, traditionally seen uh, a lot of consumers think that a lot of things originate from Europe. Well, that's of course partly true. Uh, of course, the, we have a lot of traditional chocolate companies and a very high quality chocolate uh, mm -hmm. being made for a very long time in, in, in Europe. Uh, however, uh, let's say in, 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 in the past decades, due to scale up, only big factories emerged, even in Europe. So let's okay. say the small makers just disappeared, all kinds of brands, and especially also in the Netherlands, all kinds of brands that we take for granted also in our uh, in our childhood. They... Very long time ago, Holland had a lot of small chocolate factories. In the 1950s and 60s, they started disappearing due to the, say, the scaling of the chocolate industry. So basically, there was, of course, still chocolate. Some brands were still around, but let's say it was made all by the same big factories. Uh, some uh, in Belgium, uh, but it, it carried, uh, for example, Dutch uh, brands. However, uh, what we find uh, inspiring about, let's say, the bean to bar movement back then in, uh, in the United States is that there were some small makers who were proving that there is a market and there is uh, there are people out there, they say, no, I don't want to have the mass market stuff. I am willing to pay more mm -hmm. for high quality. So that's what is actually triggered us. Not particularly, let's say, uh, all the, all the, uh, the that, famous European brands, but yeah, yeah but maybe the smaller brands from the US, like Dan Lion at that time was still small. Mm -hmm. Most brothers were then just starting actually to, uh, to yeah. become more famous. Um, and there were 
lots and lots of smaller factories as well. Yeah. Uh, but when we started practicing, actually, uh, because we, our background was not chocolate, so we... Right. A lot of makers, their background was not chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> wine, wine and pastry is still different from chocolate making. So we were just, we've been experimenting mm -hmm. my, at my home. One of the rooms in the house where my wife used to keep her uh, shoes and, uh, and purses. <laughs> so a couple of, couple of years, we practiced there one day per week. To, to see if we could get to, to, to the right recipes and to mm -hmm. find, say, our own way of making chocolate. Uh, we visited a famous chocolate maker in the UK, Duffy, from uh, Duffy Red Star Chocolate. And he was so kind uh, to show us his, uh, his small factory. And uh, so that's where we got some ideas of uh, how we wanted to make the chocolate. And we came to Mar we first entered the market in early 2019. Yeah. So it took, yeah. took some time to develop. Yeah, also, it's, it's, of course, that, let's say building a factory uh, back then there was no turnkey solution. Nowadays, you've got more uh, machines. Oh yeah. But yeah. we had to go through the trouble to making machines ourselves. So that was uh, a bit uh, and challenging. We, we made a few mistakes there, which is not surprises. So we, we we decided to import our own uh, machines from India, um, which took a lot of time to get them CE certified, etc., uh, which mm -hmm. was. Hindsight probably a mistake, but uh, anyway, that's what you learn from. So, uh, yeah, we, we, we did the source, but also we did source our own oven, which is, I think, the basis of the specific flavor profile that we still have. Okay. Uh, we don't use an oven anymore, but it had a different temperature structure or, or pattern than most of the ovens that are being used by beans and bar makers. So okay. it took us some extra years, but we also were, it helps us to develop our own style. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you mention about the the American companies that were doing it seem to do it successfully, you know, in Europe. Because I do find in Europe, from people I know from Italy, whoever, wherever, they they they're very suspicious of these new little shops. You know, they really have their traditional brands that they stick to. I find, and you know, even though there's Bonet Amade and all those sorts of things, the 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 whole craft movement that started in the states and that reached out to all other countries. It's a very different style. You have people making chocolate unique to their culture and wherever they are in the world. It's, it's sort of like, you know, it's like there's a lot of successful small bakeries everywhere in the world, you know, and they do so well. It doesn't matter if you're big or small, if you do a different job. Yeah. But for chocolate, for some reason, it's not there yet. You know, people, uh, it's very tricky. It's just starting to, to get there. So that's, that's a very yeah, interesting point. What you mentioned is that you can make chocolate, let's say, which is in a style which is close to your own culture. This is also why we, the name Hein and Verde means uh, near and far. So what we actually do is we source the cacao from far away and the other ingredients mainly come from the Netherlands. So we mm -hmm. use Dutch sugar, which is very neutral in flavor, much more neutral than the uh, organic cane soup sugar, which is being used by most of the chocolate makers. Right. And it's typically a Dutch traditional way of making chocolate. It's, it's always being made with very neutral beet sugar. No flavor, mm -hmm. no loss, nothing. It's very clean. Mm -hmm. uh, we do try to use um, Dutch dairy because we have a specific, the Dutch milk has a specific flavor due to the slightly salty meadows, uh, which is near the sea. And the Dutch cow races probably produce a different flavor style as well. So that's where we try to, to stay in. And also the traditional Dutch chocolates were roast it slightly lower, for example, in the lower temperatures and lower roast levels than uh, Belgian or even or French chocolates. Mm -hmm. And that's a style actually that we are still trying to, to keep and to maintain. Yeah, so Joseph, we, we mentioned it before that all the Dutch brands were disappeared because of scaling up. So therefore, we find it, uh, we are proud to, let's say, to reintroduce a Dutch brand, which is already right. making chocolate again in the Netherlands from the bean to the bar. And uh, but also uh, reintroducing, let's say, the the, the classic uh, Dutch flavor profile with right. local. Yeah. Excellent. Um, so, what's the next one here? What challenges did your business face early on, and are there any different? So, obviously, you're mentioning a little bit about the challenges logistically and the equipment and things like that. Are there any challenges that? you're still facing today that were the same back then or maybe new challenges what are the challenges that you every face today challenge, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> every day we face new challenges <laughs> well, the, well easy. you've got always uh, when you're scaling up you've got particular challenges but also the let's say the challenge that you always have if uh, if you're a chocolate maker who 
strives to make the best chocolate, in our opinion, is also, let's say, sourcing about the right ingredients. So, uh, especially when it comes to cacao, it's a natural product, so every harvest can be different. But also the farmers where we cooperate with, they, yeah, there can be uh, variances. And sometimes um, it, it happens that a certain uh, harvest is just not good enough. So that's always challenging. So therefore... Uh, so what happens in that case if you... Because I I've, I've worked at a chocolate making place once where the harvest was just not good. They couldn't use the beans. It was pretty bad. Uh, something we have a there. particular case. It's also a bar you like, uh, Joseph. You okay. uh, you find our uh, bar uh, Pearl of Ecuador. You know, it is um, a not standard uh, a standard uh, bean that we use there. Um, it's called uh, La Perla. So it's a small plot from uh, from uh, Santa Victoria. Santa Victoria. Yeah. Victoria. So they made it yeah. especially. Uh, so we we were one of the first ones to use uh, this uh, kind of cacao. However, uh, the the first harvest that you got is in that bar, and it is it's, it's it was lovely. It has new cut flavor. It was very exciting, very mellow, very not typical uh, Ecuadorian uh, cacao. Uh, but however, the next two harvests uh, we tested, and it is not good. So, based what it's we it's not do bad there, either to be honest, but it's different. So yeah. we were to repeat specific flavor profile of this bar because it's so mellow that if you close your eyes you probably think you're eating milk chocolate <laughs> uh, and uh, and so it was it's impossible to to repeat that uh, that style in that case we won't make it we won't we make it won't, which is a, yeah. but it's, it's even worse than between harvests also within harvest so i think the, one of the biggest challenges is the, consist the consistency of the cacao that we work with uh, and it is simply because um, Cow is a, is not a hermaphrodite; it can't fertilize itself, so it's always a crossing between two different trees, and uh, that gives a lot of differences. Every seed is a brother or sister of the other. Every bean is a brother or sister of the other. Not While in wine, for example, exactly. uh, grape in a vineyard has the same DNA, DNA. and uh, this is really a challenge. Um, so sometimes we we now, for example, we work with a lovely cacao from Venezuela. And uh, we have a batch, but half of the bags are different from the other half. So we need <laughs> to, to define new roast profiles for the second half of the batch. Uh, the same harvest. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, in a way, it's, it's satisfying if you succeed in that, but it's also a lot of work, very frustrating, you know, and that, that goes into the cost too of a small business, you know, when you have to keep changing the gears, that adds a lot of pressure yeah. to you guys. But it's nice that you guys seem to be, um, pushing through it and excited for these challenges at the same time. But it is disappointing when you don't get the consistency. So oh, sometimes you're just so excited it's about also a particular flavor. So you want to have it again. Yeah. And <laughs> However, also, looking, looking from a professional point of view, it's always very nice to have a challenge and to figure it out and how to uh, to squeeze out more flavor out of the bean. So that's yeah. always nice. And we have, let's say, I think we use one instrument to, to face this challenge specifically, because what we normally do is we roast the beans in different ways. So each bean gets two, sometimes three different roasts. And that, those three different batches, we then blend again into the bar. Mm. And by blending, so each, even a single estate from a single plantation or the Pearl of Ecuador from a okay. single pot is a blend of different roast profiles, mostly. I think there's one or two bars that we've produced that were not a blend of roast profiles, but normally we do. And that gives you some degrees of freedom to make to alter the blend or to make changes so for example if you have um, a roast which is more on the fruity side the other roast is more like on the nutty or more like coffee flavors or darker and some are lighter some are more floral and it gives you so if the, if the batch is less fruity you can add more percentage of the let's say the fruit dominated uh, uh, um, profile so that gives a bit of uh, yeah so in, in in time, it gives us a neat freedom uh, to to experiment, but it's also became a, a signature as we feel it uh, typically for Heine Vera chocolate. So we're using, we call it a multi-roast, multiple uh, uh, roasting profiles on beef, and we do that to to make the flavor of the bar even more complex, so that the yeah. mouth is, is, is elongated, if you will. Yeah, so you yeah. could say the chocolates that we make are less profound in one or two flavor directions, or maybe a few, and are more like there's more different flavors, which can by some people be interpreted as more modest or more uh, more backward or more easygoing. But mm. if you 
if you taste it carefully, there's lots of flavors to discover and uh, lots of layers and layers and layers of flavors and, and aromas that, uh, that will enter in the, in, the, in the tasting experience. Yeah, it's a really efficient, very interesting way to develop that layering is the different roasts blending them together. Some makers don't like the idea of blending different beans. Um, they're more of a purist, you know, if everything has to be Madagascar or something like that, um, which I understand. I appreciate that too. But it's interesting that you do the blend of roast in the same origin. That's that's very that's very interesting. Yeah, very yeah. inventive. Yeah. And why do you do your blends? What is your reason for doing? A, you have your single origins, and then you have a few blends. Why do those? Well, because so, of yeah. the the let's say the background in wine that we have. Yeah, let's say uh, what makes a good wine. It's uh, of course, you can explain it uh, better than I, but... It's about balance of flavors. So some wines are not blends, are like the Pinot Noir or Burgundy, just contain one grape. The Bordeaux are sometimes a blend of five grapes. Um, it, so it's not a it's not a, a rule that you always have to blend different uh, different varieties, right. but it does add something, uh, let's say, it does add an element of, of, of balance and complexity um, to a specific origin. Not every blend is successful, so it's, it's really a challenge to blend. Uh, but um, yeah, it, it yeah. gives the opportunity to create new flavors because particularly if you use those, you can blend, let's say, three different chocolates. But if you blend them in the grinder, the different nibs, the different cacao types, you get, it's like, um, it, it's like uh, in the Indonesian cuisine, um, um, Indonesian uh, cuisine, you make um, a paste of different uh, spices, which is called the bumbu. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, the different spices will interact even before the dish is made. And uh -huh. this is like the same with the chocolate. If you if you blend the different origins or the different plantations in the grinder, the acidity of one bean will develop other flavors in the other ones. And uh, and it's a fascinating process. So it's simply our the, the way that we are fascinated yeah. about. But so so it, and let's say if you use the analogy of uh, making wine, the uh, what makes a constitutes a good wine, in our opinion, is that. You have a complex flavor profile. Every time you take a sip, you can discover something new in your glass, and it has a long, uh, pleasant uh, aftertaste. Yeah. And because we use multiple rose trials, for example, on a single plantation, mm -hmm. it helps us to create those complex flavors within one origin and make the aftertaste pleasant. Uh, and, and also, in our case, we presented, let's say, our bars in a very um, uh, convenient way. Let's say it's always a pleasant. It's not a, let's say. Uh, a struggle to eat our bar. <laughs> no, definitely that's not. Reason, that's one other reason why we started making a blend because, as we told you, we are sort of trying to stay in the tradition of the Dutch chocolate making. Mm -hmm. And tradition, you know, for example, Van Houten, who invented the process of uh, of, of making actually cocoa powder, a long way back in the, in the early 19th century. Van Houten used uh, Ecuador and Venezuela. He used uh, Arriba beans and uh, and criollos from Venezuela, very high quality beans. Uh, so Dutch chocolate makers had a specific origins that they liked. Um, mm -hmm. People would interpret it as as as, uh, as the dating back to our colonial days, but it's not always the case because it was there were countries and styles that the Dutch flavor profile, the Dutch liked because of the mellow flavor profile. Mm -hmm. There's, there was also lots of so always some cacao from Indonesia, which had to do with our our heritage, our history, right. but uh, also um, Latin America and the Caribbean area, which were present in the Dutch chocolates. So that's also why we started making these Dutch originals. Okay. Yeah. Very nice. So the, the, the mix is, is, is part of the tradition. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, so, just here. okay, so a couple questions here. When you started doing this, I know you started doing it in your home and you probably gave it to friends and stuff, but when you started actually dealing with customers, how did they, how did the local people in, in Rotterdam, um, how did they receive your chocolate? What was the feedback you were getting? And do you have any, over the years, any favorite responses from customers that was felt really good to hear? <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> of course, when we started out testing out, it was just not really on the market, but let's say during this testing out, uh, we had a small lab. Uh, of course, we shared our results with, uh, of course, first our friends, but also shopkeepers. Uh, just on that basis, um, it guided us if we are on the right track or not. And um, yeah, that's how it all uh, started. And of course, you get some encour encouraging uh, remarks. Uh, but yeah, in the beginning, you don't get it always right. So it's a, quite a quest. Eh? It's not only, let's say, finding 
uh, if you're making a chocolate, building a chocolate factory, it's not only about finding the right roasting profiles, but also finding the right machines. Because uh, as you can imagine, different kind of machines result in a different way. And when you start out, let's say in a very small scale, let's say uh, kitchen skills, uh, laboratory uh, skill, as soon as you start to scale up, you need other machines, but then you discover that the flavor, profile the flavor is, is, is completely different. It's the same as like cooking for a family or cooking for yeah, a whole well, restaurant. Exactly. The just get big, getting bigger, but the same recipe doesn't work. So therefore we have to reinvent the whole thing again. But wait, back to the question, because the, the, there's, there's a nice anecdote about it, because actually the first time we presented it to our customers, it was in Amsterdam, but not in Rotterdam. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. <laughs> but that's because Jan Willem lives in Rotterdam and I live in Amsterdam. So, ah, okay. okay. Um, and uh, and there was a famous chocolate shop in uh, Chocolatel in Amsterdam that uh, the owner was so kind of to to sort of present to, to be the first to sell our chocolates and give us the floor and present his chocolates to his very critical customers. So we really got some good feedback, some That's positive good. feedback, but also some critical notes, which was nice uh, as yeah. a, to get started. It doesn't help to only get positive feedback. But yes, there are, uh, well, one of the nicer um, uh, feedbacks directly from customers is, uh, for example, on our uh, floral Bali. Uh, we've been working with Bali actually from the first day that we started uh, making chocolate. Mm. And uh, there's a, there's a, um, a shop in, in Germany. Um, and the, the owner of the shop, the daughter of the, of the owner, she's nine years old. And the, the floral Bali is her favorite chocolate. Okay, and, wow. uh, it's pretty nice to hear because it's a dark chocolate, seventy-one percent. It's pretty and intense it's, too, so it's interesting that a, a little girl would uh, appreciate on that. One hand, it's intense, and on the other hand, it has a flavor profile that is easy to appreciate. It is our best-selling dark bar, mm. uh, and it's. I think it's because it's on the one hand it's intense, and on the other hand it has, it has a flavor profile that appeals to many people and even to kids, which I think is one of the most. Uh, yeah. And, uh, if it appeals to the kids, then you have something pretty yeah. good there. It, it appeals, let's say, to the well-rounded flavors. Yeah? So yeah. It, it is accessible. We we like complex flavors, but not, let's say, um, I don't know how you call it in English, but when it gives you an uppercut or something. Yeah. So there are there are some makers out there, especially in the States or Australia or New Zealand or even Canada, where it's very different than European style bean to bar chocolate, where it's much more punch in the face. Um, do you like that sort of thing? Do you feel like there's a place for it? It's just not your style, or do you think well, it's think not even, really good chocolate? Uh, yeah, you know, I think that it, even within our range. So, for example, we also make Pura uh, Pura Blanco from Peru, and that bar actually we, uh, well, we reviews reviewers usually write about that bar. It's really like uh, upfront, truly upfront fruity flavors. We try to make it as fruity as possible. We keep all the fermentation flavors in the bar. Um, we conch it, we hardly conch it, we make it in a special grinder where it's mm. in a very short time, so it's hardly oxidized. And we immediately after grinding, um, we, we uh, pour it in, we temper it into bars and we, and we wrap it uh, airtight to keep all the fruitiness and the upfront and also lots of acidity. So I think, for example, our puree is an example of a bar where we, ex ex okay. on purpose, we keep more acidity and more upfront flavors in the bar because we simply like it because it's a playful bar. So it's a bit, it's, but yeah, so we, we do like, uh, but we like we that variety and we have different preferences. So right. it's always interesting <laughs> if we make specific versions of a bar, uh, Julie is, uh, let's say if we make three versions, Jan Willem may like number one best. I may like number three best, but we always agree that for example, number two is the best for Heine and Vera. So <laughs> on the one hand, we have our own preferences, but we usually, I think always agree on which is the best profile for the Heine and Vera brand. Okay. You guys seem to have very um, distinct, you know, distinct taste, very opinionated, but you still harmonize and uh, come together and agree. That's good. <laughs> That's very good. No, it's good because sometimes, well, you know, in Dutch <laughs> it's also a Dutch tradition how to get to compromises, it's, but it's, uh, but it's not uh, hard to, because we have a clear uh, idea of what the brand should, should be like and what the brand experience should be like. And yeah. if you define that, uh, also the way we, 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 we create new bars, uh, when we started, um, developing, uh, Hein and Vera, uh, we, because we were consultants, the first thing we did is not buying cacao. Now we defined the three brand values. <laughs> 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 Typically the response of a consultant, of a strategist. And, uh, and one of the, the values that we try to keep, uh, in, a, to, in our brand is, it's not, it's, it's written out, it's never, it, there's no place where you can read it, but it's, we call this 
uh, reinvent the past. So what we like to do is if we innovate, we like to innovate um, to make new bars which are in line with a specific tradition. Mm. So for example, the Dutch original has never had that name, but it has, but it has always been there, but it's, there's, there's never been a bar which was called Dutch original. Okay. So we went back to the tradition of chocolate making. We said, okay, let's try to keep the, the, the essence of, of these chocolates. And, and make it better. It, and, and make, make it, it better. better. <laughs> and make it better. Innovate it. Well, that's really nice. Um, it's good because I know some makers um, out there definitely, and in many food industries, they, they start off with a brand and they're like, it's good enough and we just keep doing it. But it's nice to know that there's people out there that are constantly trying to improve, improve, improve. I think that's a big part of it because... You know, chocolate over the last, my whole lifetime, your whole lifetime, maybe two, has been, you know, most of the chocolate that was pumped out by a few companies and it all sort of tastes the same and it's not directed or dictated by flavor or anything interesting. So it's nice to know that there's makers out there changing that, you know, who knows what the chocolate's going to be in 10, 20 years because of that innovation. So very exciting. Um, another question I had about the people receiving your chocolate is, Something that a lot of makers find challenging is it's one thing to sell to customers, you know, maybe try and convince them why it's cost more money and appreciate the flavors, but selling it to restaurants or, you know, um, kitchens and things where they're always looking for good ingredients, but they can't spend too much because, you know, it's really hard on their, on their business. So do you find that challenging to convince chefs and, and local companies to use your chocolate? It depends. For example, uh, we um, we have chefs in the Netherlands who work, of course, with our, uh, our chocolate, and they appreciate the complexity of the flavors that we offer, and they are also willing to pay for it. For example, we have uh, Francois Gertz. It's uh, a two-star Michelin chef. Uh, he works here in Rotterdam. With, yeah. Here in Rotterdam, he works with uh, our, our chocolate and, and, and creates a lovely uh, dishes. He likes he likes to use exactly the most exclusive ones we have. Even we we. We were, we just uh, we just received a couple of bags of a very rare uh, type of pura beans that are there are only seven bags available worldwide. We are so lucky that we have three wow. three of the bags, and um, and so he, he we tasted a sample of it and he he doesn't even care about the price. He says this is what I want in this because this is like if you taste it you, you're not tasting chocolate. So it's like right. it's like fruits and nuts and 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 lovely aromas of violets and and uh, so it's really exclusive. So it depends. But obviously, I mean, he's a Michelin star chef, so his his costs are a bit different than the average people. So what about the average well, restaurants? We, we, do you ever approach them? What do they say? Absolutely. And we have a few also using our curvature uh, as well. So what we do is that we have two lines of uh, of, of, uh, of chocolate curvature. One is our single origins and we use a, we, we also make um, a s affordable line, which is more expensive than Let's say in Holland, in Holland or in Europe, you have the big brands like Kalabout or uh, Del Polade. Uh, probably the price level of those, uh, those, 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 we will never match that. Um, yeah. We're sitting. We, we have a level of. We have a range of couvertures: uh, vegan, white, white, dark, vegan milk, uh, and milk. Five different couvertures, which are in a price level which are in between. Let's say the bean to bar um, mm -hmm. and the bean to bar specialty chocolates and the cheaper ones. So, and we we do find more and more. Bonbon bon makers or, or, or restaurants also interested in that uh, in those deadlines. But obviously, the, the chefs who are visiting us, they have a thing, of course, for flavor. Otherwise, cost-wise, yeah. you can. It's cheaper to go to a to a big manufacturer. So, if you want to improve on the quality and you want to do something exciting, you go to us. And let's say if a chef visits our factory, of course, you have a, 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 during the the tour, you have a, the tasting and you see. Uh, the lights go on, as, you, as we say it in Dutch, and then you you see their brains working. Oh, I can make this dish or create this kind of bonbon. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, uh, you get a whole uh, different uh, discussion. They get inspired huh? and then they create new recipes in their head. So, yeah, that's, the, of course, the added benefit uh, of visiting our factory. And it's also not possible, for uh, for example, an average bonbon maker in the Netherlands will probably process 1,000 kilos per month. Right. Uh, yeah. That will be too big uh, for us uh, in this stage um, to cover. So um, even with the, let's say, the more affordable line of couvertures, we will always have niche chefs that are still on a, a position slightly higher than than, a, than an average bon bon maker or restaurant. Yeah, but it's interesting that what you just said that the bean to bar movement, the bean to bar makers, it's 
at first you try and when I teach my tastings and stuff, I try and separate the two because everyone is, knows what a chocolatier is. Nobody knows what a chocolate maker is. Everybody thinks a chocolatier makes chocolate from the beans too. So there's this divide where you're trying to separate, you know, these are different, but now you have chocolatiers appreciating your work too and using that because I worked as a chocolatier for many years and I was really into fine chocolate as well, but I never understood why my, my bosses or my coworkers they love chocolate, they love working with it, but they had no interest in fine chocolate world. And I thought, I don't understand. If you're using chocolate, don't you want the best chocolate? So it's very exciting for me to hear that more chocolatiers are using that really good chocolate and supporting the small makers as well. I think that's that's very new. In the world. But it's also part of, let's say, uh, in general saying education, right? which you are part of because of your tastings, you uh, true. you get uh, a lot of people to know more about chocolate because what we discover is that a lot of chefs or consumers, they mm -hmm. don't know about that natural rich chocolate, as we like to call it, can offer all these kind of flavors. Just that chocolate can be, it's just complex as wine or coffee. Yes, but yeah. it's also interesting, as you're mentioning chefs, even for Michelin star chefs, um, if you if you work, there's two two different types of chocolate. We have, if you look at the single origins, it's like if you like football players, uh, you have the Messi and, the, and the, the, the famous star players in the team who are the star of the team. And there are also team players who, let's say, make the others better. And uh, Cooper's stir, there has to be something which which let's say lets the other ingredients get presents right. the platform the other ingredients of the bonbon or the dish. Yeah. So even the Michelin star chefs want to have a very high quality uh, 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 couverture, um, but less profound and less dominant than, for example, the single origins that we make. So now for this Michelin star chef, we are developing a special couverture, which is more subtle, more mm -hmm. flavorful. Uh, higher quality, more pure than, than let's say, the standard couverture that he was using from a famous brand, by the way, right. uh, not even a cheap brand, but less dominant and less prominent than the single origin bars that we right. have. Yeah. So it has, so we, it, 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 it has to be, that's also a big, this one of the interesting challenges to work with these, the, these types of, uh, of customers, that they challenge you to make something, okay, I want something which is as high quality as the rest, but without having too profound flavors in it so right. I can add more other and, and more ingredients. They can use it for more different things, which yes, is now, important for them. It, 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 it's a platform for the other ingredients. Yeah. No, that's, a, that's an interesting point too. And that's why I think a lot of the chocolate in the world, you know, Calibo, uh, cacao berry, whatever, is very sort of basic flavor. One, they're not using the best beans, but two, most people want that basic so they can mix all these different things yeah. in there. But that's... Yeah. Also, the sign of a good chef is that they can take something a bit more complex and still use it well. You know, that's that's yeah, a, and, a marker and, and of skill. The challenge for us is to make something which is has the same functionality, the basic, the basic couverture, but yet be more interesting and more uh, flavorful than um, than, uh, than standard stuff that they've been using. Very nice. Um, another one I want to touch on is many people today are concerned about fair trade cacao and food. So what are your, your views on fair trade and chocolate? How does that play into your, your company? <laughs> well, uh, do you want to discuss uh, particularly the fair trade brand? Because that's, a, let's say, a certain uh, certification or the idea behind uh, fair trade. Well, let's say what we do is that, uh, of course, uh, fair Just trade... Tell me, tell me what you would tell the general public that doesn't really understand too much about it. So what... What would you want to get say, across to them? The assumption is when you buy fair trade products in general, uh, that uh, the farmer gets paid more. So technically that's right. However, it's only a very uh, small amount that they get. And yes, uh, it's more in, 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 in terms of cents, in, in, in yeah, dollar I... cents or in, uh, in, 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 in euros. However, um, the attention, of course, the behind this is that you get, let's say, the farmers uh, get paid well. So what we do is uh, direct trade with the uh, farmers. We do business with the corporations and themselves, or in some cases, uh, single plantations, uh, where we pay uh, well above uh, market price. So that's, uh, in in our opinion, is that uh, that's a, a sustainable model. Yeah. So we 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 call it more like transparency because it's, well, it depends on how you define also direct trade and fair trade and all these labels are quite difficult. For us, it's really important that it's traceable, that we exactly know where the cacao comes from, who uh, who delivers it, 
uh, all the farmers get our chocolate bars as well. I think we try to make a habit of sending sending them also the end product that they're that they're producing for. Mm -hmm. And for us, it's like um, uh, it's like a prerequisite of, of doing business that everyone in the chain gets gets a fair share. And uh, but the best way uh, we always say the best way to 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 improve the, the price levels and improve the circumstances that cacao farmers work on is to make better cacao. So the biggest, the, the most efficient in, um, instrument that we have to improve the, the let's say the, the situation of the cacao farmers is to help them improve their products because then we can charge more for the bar and we can pay more for the cacao. And uh, obviously in the cacao sector where we work in. Um, uh, Can I just stop you for a second? How does paying them more help them create a better quality cacao? How does that? How does that it's not. Uh, it's costly. So there's well, first of all, it's the type of cacao that they grow. Like right? so, mm -hmm. you have like so it, the first is ninety percent of the cacao that's being um, uh, grown uh, is is more bulk bulky cacao. Right. Most of it from from West Africa. Then there's ten percent in the market, which is we call fine flavor cacao, which are more uh, complex types of cacao, more but less easy to grow, more vulnerable for diseases, so it takes mm. more attention to grow uh, them. Also, uh, fine flavored cacao has a lower yield, eh? so yep. therefore mm. there needs to be more work done to get yep. it. Yeah, also, from protecting diseases, it needs to be more yep. work done. Uh, and it's if you want to in do that in organic way, also, also ex exactly, exactly. exactly. Yeah. If you want to do that in an organic way, that means even more work. So let's say. Um, and that's only, let's say, on the on, on, on the yield uh, level. So, and then you have got, of course, another important task of the farmer is to ferment the beans. Yeah, that's also locally being done. And let's say that's why we like to uh, cooperate with the farmers as well, because let's say if you improve on fermentation techniques or do it the right way, more flavors will occur. Uh, and therefore, you'll be uh, the cocoa get more interesting. Uh, this is also one of the biggest challenges to get the fermentation right, and it's actually it's academic work. So they would they to do the fermentation of the cacao right, they need to hire someone with a PhD in chemistry, uh, which is costly. So it is in the the segment that we operate in, the cacao prices are are uh, the cacao that we now have just uh, brought to the factory is probably ten times as expensive as the standard bulk cacao. Right. At least. So that's. That's an important point because a lot of people still don't understand the cost difference, why it's so much more. And a, a lot of fine chocolate is also associated with usually organic if they can, and also fair trade. Even if it's not fair trade certified, they say we're using fair trade. So people assume, okay, maybe it's the same quality cacao as Nestle, but it's fair trade organic. That's why it's more, right? But I think it's important for people to know that there's a little bit of that, the fair trade, you want to pay them more to, to better their lives and to maybe pay for organic, which may reduce the yield. But then in general, because of the species, there's reduced yield. It takes a lot more work. They're fermenting locally. So a lot of labor for something that produces less yield. Um, fair trade on top of that to... Um, and they very often grow it in... They very often grow it in, uh, in agroforestry systems, so which is good for the environment as well. So it's because it's a it's a tree that uh, try, that likes to live in the shade. So it's very productive to grow it in a forest or in a uh, in a jungle and combine and, uh, it with other fruits like uh, banana. Or yes, something. but obviously it's a bit more costly and labor intensive to have uh, a tree every year and here and there in the in the forest than uh, than uh, growing on one plantation. Right. So yes, definitely the biggest price difference. Uh, the biggest quality difference, but also quality of life difference is being made by sourcing high quality cacao and yeah. turning it into a product which is not as cheap candy, but something which is more like of gastronomic value and uh, with a higher gastronomic value and higher flavor experience or uh, more interesting. Yeah, flavor. because I think it's nice to know that there's a lot of farmers out there who grow cacao. Some of them, you know, just like my, my family before me, you know, they were poor farmers, whatnot, and they wanted to better themselves, move to another country, and, and they didn't want to do farming. But there are people who love and, and respect, every, they like their work, they're proud of their work. And so it's, it's a lot of them, I think, uh, want to keep growing cacao and, and keep growing really good. They feel good that their cacao is really better than a lot of other people's cacao and things like that. So yeah. I think that's another important factor we have to keep in mind um, that's happening behind the scenes. So. Very good points. I like that. Um, and one other thing I liked about that I saw on your website recently, um, and this is something I learned at a chocolate making place in New Zealand, was 
when you guys are making your hot chocolate, you recommend that people steam it in the cappuccino steamer on the machine. And that's the best, it's such, it's the best way to make really good hot chocolate. I love it. When I saw that, I was like, oh, very nice. And some people are scared of that. I went to a local place and I said, you know, hey, if you guys want, you know, I have some bean to bar chocolate, you guys can use it. And this is a good way to make it. And they're like, no, 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 no. I don't want to ruin my cappuccino maker with that. So <laughs> does it ruin? Do you think it ruins cappuccino makers or what? <laughs> no, definitely not. It no. is uh, exactly the same way. It's, let's say we sell to, um, to cafes who specialize also in very nice uh, coffees. Yeah? So, uh, so therefore, our, our always the question is, of course, you put so much effort and time in uh, sourcing good quality coffee. What about uh, drinking chocolate? And then we introduce them to, of course, the single origins chocolates. And uh, then the, the baristas, uh, they, they love it. But they also can prepare it in the same manner as a, uh, for example, as a cappuccino. Huh? Instead of foaming milk, you can also foam uh, your the drinking chocolate. So, yeah. And even if you like latte art, you can do that as well. So it's basically the whole show, eh? the whole experience of going to a nice cafe and drinking a high quality coffee now can also be turned into an experience of drinking and a high quality uh, drinking chocolate. And the interesting thing is, so also in our drinking chocolate lineup, we have, let's say, two different lines. So we have the single origin line, where you have it's more expensive and it's really be appreciated by uh, the traditional coffee roasters who have their own cafe. Uh, where people are used to paying quite a lot of money for uh, for uh, for uh, uh, whatever uh, for an espresso or a cappuccino, and so that, uh, and but we also have a, a line what we call our Dutch original drinking chocolate, which is a bit more affordable, which is really high quality, and it's, I, I think it's even more tailored to making drinking chocolates than than the other single origins, and that's being used by cafes who just want to have a Beautiful. very good drinking chocolate. Um, but not so much. They may, may not have an audience that that appeals to to that, that likes single origin concept right. in any way. So, and of course, I don't know what the situation is. Of course, in Canada, but Joseph, you probably agree with us that let's say uh, make preparing and drinking chocolate on the basis of real chocolate with lots of natural flavor is a completely different experience than a traditional chocolate. Here in the Netherlands, it's based on powder. Uh, and because you guys uh, made it, so <laughs> they like no, their powder. So, so yeah. the, the, the drinking chocolate that we're offering now is thick and creamy and yeah. full of. So, you, you might say in this in this case, we're not really in a Dutch tradition because we try to change the, the, the yeah. chocolate. Yeah. chocolate we, we try to For 150 it. years or 70 years. Yeah. <laughs> but um, no, and the, the important thing of the drinking chocolate, too, and to be honest, I think I like drinking chocolate more than eating chocolate bars, to be honest. I love having a nice hot cup of milk. Do you prefer a, does it normal milk or, or dairy or just uh, or oat milk? Or how do you make it? Water? Or? Usually just regular milk, but I'll try yeah. sometimes oat milk is nice as well. Sometimes my own homemade oat milk. But um, what I like also is that method of steaming it is the texture, the foam and the texture, which is so important. Which yeah. goes back to why no. the Mesoamericans liked their chocolate, right? It was that foam, it was that. And so I think that's an important part that a lot of people forget is when you're drinking chocolate, it's the texture and the flavor together, not just heated up chocolate milk sort of thing, you know? Well, let's say also from a cafe or uh, consumer point of view, the added benefit of, let's say, using the drinking chocolate as the way as we make it, uh, you have the, as a consumer, you have the, and as a cafe, you have the freedom to combine it with any uh, dairy product as you want, because some right. like regular cow milk, but some nowadays, uh, let's yeah. say in an element, I don't know how it is, 50% is already, is already, is already, let's say, uh, oat milk or, uh, or almond milk, that sort of stuff. Yeah. Excellent. Um, yeah, we talked about that. Aging is something that you make a point of, um, of putting on your website. A lot of people do it, but you make a point to put it on there. Is there anything you want to say about aging? Do you think it's necessary that all chocolate makers age their chocolate? But I think you mentioned the Piura one. You don't age, you just get it out there. The opposite, actually. I mean, so it depends on the, on the, on the cacao and the chocolate. So, um, well, you know. we, well, we, let's say we started, let's say, yeah, what we do, we already discussed, let's say that we do uh, roaster blending. Uh, but we also, yeah, so uh, we also explain that our objective is always to get uh, the flavors as complex as possible. Uh, and one of the techniques is, of course, is let's say the aging. That can, we can do that on top as well. Sometimes we prepare a, um, uh, a chocolate 
uh, in a way so that it needs to age for a while. So then we put it into uh, stainless steel uh, bins mm -hmm. and therefore instead of, let's say, forcing with a conch, yeah, let's say aerating is that in, a, in a, an important step in making sugar, we instead we just put it away and let time do its thing. But then the result is a very different uh, flavor profile. You, 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 in terms of wine, you could compare it. Sometimes you have a bottle of wine which is too young to drink, a Barolo from four years old, and uh, you can decant it. So you get a lot of oxygen added to it and it uh, reveals more flavors. It gets more smooth and mellow. It gets also more upward fruity flavors, but it will never be as complex as the Barolo bottle that has aged for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And it's the same with, uh, with chocolate. There are specific types of chocolates. Not all chocolates can age. Depends. If there's some tannin in the bean, you can use that to let it age. Right. It will be it will be broken down slowly. Yeah. And it's like the, some is, uh, some cacao types age on their uh, on the acidity structure, like Pinot Noir grapes age on their acidity, not on their tannins. And uh, what happens actually is so it, so to be a bit let's say you you could compare conching the chocolate to decanting the wine as a cheap and dirty method and uh, and the real method is aging because then you okay. give the, the chocolate the time to I never cut. thought of that that's a good way to put it yeah very nice but obviously it's not always the case so sometimes because you always get more upfront fruity flavors if you conch it you will never have uh, the, the fruitiness of the chocolate will also change so you get more uh, secondary and tertiary aromas and, and and flavors in your chocolate if you age it but they can be really interesting. And we also did a, a Solera style blending where we combine younger chocolates with aged chocolate of the same batch. So oh, one, two yeah. years, one year, and let's say one month or even no aging. Yeah. And if you combine that in a bar, you get also a different way of blending, but Beautiful. then blending with different aging. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, that's very yeah. cool. Very nice. You guys are all about the blending. That's interesting. It's amazing. It's, it's kind of like, you know, you have the same ingredient. It's just the method completely changes everything. It has nothing to do with adding any new ingredients, nothing, just the method. Method is very important. I think that's what a lot of people in the public don't understand about culinary is they're always looking for the right recipe, the ingredients, but the method is so important. Um, it's even the grinder, so the different type of grinder that you use. So for example, in, in some grinders, the pura gets more fruity than in other grinders. So we, we pick now, usually we use one grinder, but we, uh, which is really suitable for making the fruity the chocolate. But in the time we didn't have that grinder, we used two different grinders, one which makes it very fruity and the other one which can produce more volume uh, uh, to, to sort of create the flavor profile of the bar. Yeah. Do you know Do you know why that machine tends to make it more fruity? Uh, it has to do with the, the level of oxidation. So if you have a lot of oxidation very quickly, uh, you get more upfront fruity flavors. So because of the style, there's yeah, more oxidation. Yeah, a very small grinder, which uh, in, in a very small amount in a grinder, you mm -hmm. get more oxidation and the cacao will be more, the chocolate will be more fruity, but it will lose its fruitiness also quicker. So you need also right. yeah. the bigger grinder will give slower development, but also keeps its flavors longer. That's a good point. Too. That's what you can play with as well. You can also blend different grinders. Yeah. Chocolate, the same chocolate from different grinders. Yeah, it's yeah, fun. Eh? The a same bean, of... only using different techniques and styles just to get more flavor out of it. Or more yeah, balance. Amazing. People always, when you think of food, you think of adding things to add more flavor. And really, you know, you're not adding anything. You're just you using the right see, techniques. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, sure. So if you do a little tour, you can see we have three different grinders here working and running in different sizes, and they give different flavor profiles. Sometimes you use one grinder for one specific cacao, but sometimes we blend this. Yeah. And what is your lineup right now of bars? Is there anything you want to highlight? Um, yeah, maybe the Dutch <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's a nice okay. idea. Yeah, well, we also, let's say, let's say, apart from the, the lineup, so on average, we have, let's say, 12, uh, 12 bars always uh, on stock. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, not all flavors are available because of a bad uh, harvest, then we don't use it. However, uh, last time we introduced a, a new uh, bar and uh, Hey, well, sorry, I had to point out. <laughs> we want to show you something uh, special. Uh, one of the special things that we would like to show you is, for example, we also um, make a. Um, um, we recently introduced a milk bar which has contains Dutch vanilla. And you may wonder, what is uh, Dutch vanilla? Yeah, I saw that. Vanilla grown in the Netherlands. 
obviously everybody knows that we're uh, the <laughs> as a tropical uh, crop. However, uh, the Netherlands is, I can assure you, not tropical. Uh, <laughs> but we have greenhouses here. So we had a cooperation, oh, wow. the University of Wageningen, which is uh, well known for its uh, uh, ability to 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 uh, grow uh, grow crops, and one of the experiments that they did is uh, they grow um, uh, ex started experimenting with van growing vanilla beans in uh, greenhouses, and uh, so therefore they have this developed a variety which is a, a Dutch vanilla pot. So we together we work that with them, and we use that uh, to combine it with a Granada uh, cacao. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. I will get yeah, one. Yeah, I, I couldn't. There should be, a, <laughs> but I couldn't find it. So because we we have to, we have to, we just. Uh, it's very it. interesting. It makes me wonder if uh, one day you're ah. going to be growing cacao in a greenhouse there. Uh, that could be. Diff that's probably difficult. <laughs> that's probably going to be too much chocolate. Ah, you got it. So just to show the limited edition that we have, I couldn't. There it is. Nice. <laughs> 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 it's a it's it's a limited uh, limited. Oh, sorry, that's a dark or what is it? Yeah, so bar. perhaps uh, what we uh, it, it's milk bar in this case. Oh, no. yeah. uh, we always put it in a black box. That means it's uh, it's hand numbered. So we only make fifteen hundred bars. So it's very rare. Mm. Dutch vanilla is not for sale, so it's very exclusive. So we like to do this kind of uh, stunts for people who like uh, culinary things to experience new things. So therefore. Mm. Uh, uh, we, 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 yeah, well, <laughs> we it's make exciting. Yeah. yeah. We, we have just made the last batch of Dutch Speculaas, which is also a flavored bar. We're not so much into flavored bars, but, uh, the last couple of months we made a few ones. And Speculaas is a famous Dutch cookie. Uh, okay. Uh, and there's, there's actually yeah. seven different spices in it. And so we added also to, uh, and for that bar, we, we sort of rearranged the amount of each of the spices to tailor it to the flavor of chocolate. So if you okay. would just use normal recipe, it won't work. Normally you buy the ready-made mix, but we went through the top to make all the spices ourselves. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> so, and in the lineup, so we- You know what you should food. make? You should make a chocolate speculus spread. That would be amazing too. Because ah, yeah, <laughs> there's a I, lot of speculus spreads, but there is like vegetable oil and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> But you mentioned speculo, so I have to uh, I have to uh, <laughs> to correct you uh, <laughs> because different. it's different. Speculos and speculas, you know, it sounds different. But one is from Belgium and one is from the Netherlands. So ah, okay. speculos, it's both a Dutch word uh, meaning it is los means without in Dutch, and it means without the expensive spices. So <laughs> speculos is made of burnt sugar and cinnamon, okay. while Speculas is made out of uh, uh, seven different spices. Seven different spices. Oh, Let's say in, a, in a, a couple of centuries ago, when they discover it, it was extremely expensive to make it. So therefore, right. uh, they div uh, invented a more cheaper variety, which is called speculos. Interesting. So I guess I haven't had really good speculas <laughs> before. Uh, it's nice. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> One of the ingredients is a little bit of white pepper because the old name of the cookie was pepper pepper cookie. Okay. Okay. Very nice. Um, okay. And my last question is, well, before I ask the last question, did you guys want to show a quick tour of the place or is that yeah. here? Yeah. You want to, you. Are you able to with the camera? Yeah, I yeah, think so. Well, let, let's figure out how to do it and to walk okay. with the laptop or something. Um, but I have to discover where the camera is, <laughs> where the camera is. So I cannot see. <laughs> So you have to guide us a little bit, uh, Joseph, if you can okay. see all the stuff. So, so far, we can... so good. <laughs> so... <laughs> Do you want to... Uh... Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, there's the cacao. Yeah, you were frozen for a second. There you are. Okay. This is just what we keep a part of the stock here. Okay. Part of the stock here. Uh, as you probably know, Amsterdam is a lot of warehouses there, and we're also our stock. Some six bags coming in, and uh, Amazon will put next week. Uh, Ecuador, but that's basically what we work with. Uh, in the, uh, this uh, is uh, our work working stock. The rest okay. of the stock is in Amsterdam. Okay, okay. I was going to say, that's not a lot of cacao for you guys. <laughs> 
<laughs> we can make let's say we can do uh, this part. Okay, now I can see you again. I'm th I'm afraid that uh, down the factory there is uh, less uh, reception. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I see you have the ovens here. And this, yeah, here we have two ovens, uh, convection ovens. Here we also select the cacao by hand. Some of the bags and the cacao types are already selected for us on the farms, which mm. we like a lot. So we pay a dollar extra and we get okay. reselected uh, beans. Um, but for some of the cacaos, uh, we selected ourselves uh, by hand. Uh, cacao is then uh, being roasted in the ovens, uh, as we said, multiple profiles per, per bean. And the winnower, when we take off the shells and we keep the nibs in, uh, in these boxes. Mm -hmm. uh, that's about it, actually. All right. Very nice. We have some grinders. We have some grinders here to set up, so you can... Uh, There's the big one. There's three grinders. <laughs> Here's a smaller one that I mentioned that we use for, um, for example, for Pura, but for other times right. as well. Right. So, uh, here's a big side grinder. Uh, currently, we're running... Uh, um, with barley in it, and uh, here we have uh, this is going to be drinking chocolate. This is a nice one because we can easily lift the wheels, so it's mm. easier to. So, if we make flavored bars like with uh, the Dutch Bay glass or with vanilla, it's easy to make in this one because we can lift uh, the granite wheels and we can fully clean it. Yeah, so it's a lot of work to clean. Now, with these three, we can produce around 700 kilos monthly. There's a new big grinder coming in because we have to keep up with the... Uh, oh, good. Nice. Out, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. And there's your tempering machines. With the tempering machines. Currently, we use two tempering machines. Uh, we have a specific uh, dispenser hat to... Uh, to, uh, to pour our specific bars that we make. So we can do like, I think we can pour like 750 bars in, uh, in half an hour. Wow. And, uh, and uh, then we, we wrap them uh, airtight in the, in the airtight machine over there. And then we have a couple of uh, staff that helps us uh, uh, wrap all the boxes and put all the stickers on them. So currently the, the, the wrapping and the packaging part of the process is a bit of the, is more like a bottleneck, getting more and more of a bottleneck. So we have to find yeah. out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I appreciate the packaging, though. I like it's very unique. You know, I think it's you a, guys have a very no, distinct. No, 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 is the designer of all our uh, all our material, but also oh, okay. the packaging. Oh wow! Very nice. Excellent. Well, and in the back, of course, you see that we have our stock and that sort of stuff. More oh, okay. Super, more uh, yeah, the expedition. And on top, uh, we have our office. <laughs> oh, okay. Beautiful. Very nice. Oh, that's about it. Yeah. So that's a quick uh, factory uh, tour. Thank you, you very much. For, uh, a small, uh, a small bean to bar uh, maker. So, do you guys do everything in there, or do you have workers other than for packaging? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. We have a couple of part timers working for us. Yeah. Uh, uh, Tempering and starting to get too much. Yeah. Excellent. Very nice. Okay, and where can people? You know, whether they're in um, North America or Europe or wherever, do you ship to other countries outside yeah. of Europe? Where can people find your products if they want to purchase them? Well, the easiest way is to go, of course, to our web shop and, uh, web shop, uh, website and click on uh, shops. Uh, there you see the oh, list and there you discover that we're now selling in 14 uh, countries. So uh, some of them are shipping worldwide. So there's always an opportunity to, to get a bars and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and taste high in the chocolates. Excellent. Any other last remarks that you wanted to say about you yourself, your work, your company, anything like that? Let's see. What can we? Uh, what can we add more? What can we add? Uh, <laughs> you said a lot. No, well, any, well, any any customer of yours and uh, that that tastes our chocolate and wants to share an experience with it, we mm. invite. Them, so you Go like to, to hear that. Send an email or, or approach us via Instagram because customer feedback is really what. Um, what, what also keeps us going and uh, what helps us to improve the product. And it's always nice if people like it, but it's always good if people say, well, yes, uh, I just had a batch which, uh, which I've tasted this and this, and maybe we can change it or not. And uh, yeah. uh, give us feedback. Okay. Excellent. I like that. 
Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. I really enjoyed talking to you. Um, I like that you guys like to talk a lot because I like to talk a lot too. So <laughs> it, was, it was very nice. Um, but uh, thank you for your work. And I hope to have more of your bars soon. And I hope you continue for a very long time with what you're doing. Well, thank, thank you, you for, uh, for allowing us to present our chocolates and ourselves. Excellent. All right. Well, you have a good day. All the best. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Take care.